What's up, testing family? It's here, so show of hands. How many of you people have ever been asked a question before? What? <laughs> We're just trying to get a gauge on audience participation. It looks like a boy can do that with us in the studio. Um, so, what's up? Nice. <laughs> My name is Jeremy. I'm relatively new to the QA life. I started about four years ago with absolutely no experience whatsoever. I knew nothing about code or automation, but I've learned a lot since then. I love test automation, and I'm excited to share what I've learned with this awesome testing community. Awesome, I'm Butch Mayhew. I've been in quality assurance team for the past three years. Uh, I enjoy learning uh, new things, finding bugs, working with developers to make awesome software, and that is really a cool So we're gonna deal with it, unless there's something we can do about it. All right, so the title of this talk is Automate the Monolith, and we, we kind of wanted to share what that means. We have like a large legacy web application, that's our monolith. Um, to give you a little bit about it, we, we serve member-centric nonprofits like YMCAs. So in a given month, we have 24,000 active users. There's 38 million people in our database. We record 12 million check-ins per month, 400,000 program registrations, and we process credit cards and EFTs for our customers. So our application does a lot of stuff, but it wasn't always that way. It started out kind of like this Tiki Hut, where it just did one thing really well. But it started to grow as our customer base grew, and so we added new features, some standards were established, and now we're at the point where we're adding state-of-the-art features for much more sophisticated clients. However, those state-of-the-art features are being built on top of the same foundation that was laid like a long time ago. So it is very easy to like make a change in one area of our system and introduce a bug in another seemingly unrelated area. So this results in having to do manual regression. We have to do it very often. Um, we hate that. All right, there, there's a better way to spend our time, right? Forks and eyeballs, like Matlock marathons, anything. <laughs> so um, we wanted to automate regression just to make our lives better. Um, so before we get into our talk, there's just a couple things we wanted to throw out there. Um, Automation is not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all your quality problems. So you're not going to hear us say that today. Um, also, when we say automated tests, we mean automated checks. Um, we understand that having an automated test for something is just a way of having a computer check for an expected result. It's not the same thing as a human being exploring that feature. All right, with that out of the way, everybody hold on to your butts because our thesis for this talk is shocking. We're going to argue that in some cases, it's in your best interest to have an automated test suite composed almost entirely of UI tests. Most people would disagree with that. All right. So looking at the testing pyramid, most of y'all are probably familiar with this. Um, there are different levels of automation. So if you don't know what like test automation is, this is like intro one-on-one. -on -one. And hopefully there's some good um, ideas that you can kind of take of this to explain it to other people. Um, so beginning with the base, you've got automated unit test coverage. This should cover a higher percentage of the test than the next level, which is integration tests. Those are like API level tests, um, with the smallest percentage being automated UI tests. Uh, in addition to most testing pyramids, this one includes a cloud above to represent manual session-based exploratory testing. Um, talking about like how big that cloud should be is like a whole other talk, like how much testing should we do? Uh, but we're not going to get into that today. Um, and we're going to go through like an example on each of these using a car. So we're going to talk about unit tests, integration tests, and functional tests. So starting out with unit tests, a def simple definition of a unit test is a test to ensure that a single component logic is correct. Okay, so for this example, we're gonna use a gas gauge, okay? I wanna test a gas gauge for accuracy. How would I go about doing that? I've got a couple different test cases, but first, we need something. We need a 10 gallon gas tank, because that's what we're gonna start with, and some form of liquid to put in that gas tank. So for my first test case, I'm gonna fill the tank with 2.5 gallons of gas, and my expectation is the gauge to read 20% full. So another test case, would be, I empty the tank, and I expect the gauge to read empty. So the third test case is I would fill the tank with five gallons of water and five gallons of gas, and 
I expect the read, the gauge to read 100% full. So in this example, we're exercising the functionality of that single component, the gas gauge, and just verifying the measurement is correct. The gas gauge should read back based on how much liquid is in the tank accurately. This is a unit test, it's not gonna care about whether it's gasoline or soap or water or whatever, right? So it's just gonna ensure that this logic is working. There is value in that. Next, we're gonna talk about integration testing. Simple definition is a test to ensure different components when combined work properly together. So for this, we're gonna ensure that an engine can run with the proper input. So our need, we need a gas gauge, 10 gallon tank and an engine in some form of liquid. So we are going to fill the tank with 2.5 gallons of gas. We're gonna crank the engine and it should run. We're going to empty the tank. We're gonna crank the engine and it shouldn't start. It doesn't start. We're also gonna fill the tank with five gallons of gas and five gallons of water. We're gonna crank the car and the engine comes out. So these are different test cases that we can use to kind of explain what the integration test does. And we see here in this scenario that these integration tests go a bit deeper than just testing the measurement of a single component. We see that for this level of testing, it's a bit more complex and more things can go wrong. In many more scenarios, we could come up with to, to verify this and to test this. Um, but we also see that we, all, we test how things interact with one another. For our third example, or a third type, we're gonna talk about uh, a UI test or a functional test. So in our world, we have a web application, so it's gonna be different for if you're testing like a software, like an application you install on your desktop. But for a web application, the driver of that is gonna be a web browser. So this is a UI test. The way I would define it in our world is a test that is browser driven, that verifies usability by running checks on the application or system itself. So for this test case, we're gonna ensure, we're only gonna do one test case, because these can get really big. Uh, we're, we're gonna ensure that a car can accelerate from zero to 60 in 12 seconds. We're gonna test that. So for that, we're gonna need um, an entire car, which is a complete system with all components in working order, and these are gonna be the test steps. Uh, first test step is I'm gonna fill the gas tank with 2.5 gallons of gas, I'm gonna crank the car, and it runs. So that's gonna be like our integration test is gonna tell us, hey, the car can run. <clears throat> We're gonna put the car in drive. We're gonna start the stopwatch. We're gonna press and hold down the gas pedal, because it's fun to do. We're gonna watch the speedometer, and when it reaches 60, I'm gonna stop the stopwatch and verify the results. So all these steps are one single kind of functional test. There's a lot of steps, it's complex, uh, test to run, uh, mainly because we're relying on a complete system, an entire functioning system, to be able to test these results. All right, so from this example, you can see that there are <laughs> different levels, and we are, like, we, we give the testing pyramid the seal of approval, um, but we still believe that in some cases, it is in your best interest to have an automated test suite composed almost entirely of UI tests. And Jeremy, well, here's why. Yeah, so obviously the test pyramid industry standard, and it, it's been accepted by everybody, but it does come with some assumptions, right? Um, the very foundation is unit tests. It's assuming that your code is unit testable, right? And on that middle layer, it's assuming that you have APIs available for integration testing. Will, our monolith application, has most of our business logic and storage procedures, which is not unit testable. And we have business logic and classes that cannot be instantiated outside of the context of a browser. Also, we don't have very many APIs for us to be able to write any integration tests. And it honestly doesn't make that much great business sense to go back through our entire huge application and add them everywhere. So the question is, what do we do? We're firm believers in the testing pyramid, right? But our code is not unit testable. We have very few APIs for integration tests. So what does that leave us? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> we end up with a crap ton of UI tests in, in our automated suite. And so that's kind of where we, we, in this case, we would come around our thesis of saying, it is in our best interest that where we are today to have an automated test suite composed almost entirely 
of UI tests. And so, kind of giving you the overview, now we're gonna get into more of the meat of the talk and take you through our story. We came into that realization, this is where we're at, we need, we wanna automate manual regression, so how do we do it? And um, with that, I'll just tell you a story real quick. My dad knew a guy he really respected. He asked the guy, like, man, how do you make such good decisions? And the guy said, experiment, experience. So my dad thought, he's like, well, how do you get experience? And the guy replied, bad decisions. <laughs> and so with that in mind, we're gonna take you through our bad decisions that we've made in the past, all right? And then we'll tell you where we are today and what's made us, what we found really valuable. We're gonna end up in the talk um, expect, telling you where we expect to be in the future. But first, let's go back in time to the year 2008, as critical failures in the US financial system began to peak. Our critical failures in automation had just begun. Our very first attempt was to use Quick Test Pro. We hired one person to do all of our automation. Um, we found it really easy to click and record tests, but it became difficult to maintain as the application changed. And that one person that we hired to do our automation left, and all of our experience left with it. <laughs> so the tests were left unattended, unmaintained, and much like any houseplant I've ever owned, they died. <laughs> all right, so we went on from that. We had a second attempt. We said, let's go ahead and use WADR. It stands for Web Application Testing in Ruby. I'm sure most folks are familiar with that. But we liked WADR. We found it to be flexible. It allowed us to customize and easily update our tests as the application changed. But our process for setting up test data was unreliable. And we only had automation running in one QA environment. It wasn't as extendable as we needed it to be. Um, like our first attempt, we had one person ultimately responsible for automation. This time we did have the vision of building something, a framework that all of our development teams would become responsible for contributing to and maintaining, but that never really happened. It just remained one person's job. Attempt number three. So our third attempt, we actually used a framework called WaterMate. Uh, you've probably never heard of that because it's not public. We actually paid a consultant to come in and to kind of review our automation. And he said, hey, water's good. I can make it better. I'm gonna write a water on top of water. I'm gonna write water mate, which is a wrapper on top of water, which is already a wrapper on top of selenium. And um, he wrote this really powerful framework that uh, he understood it, and one or two devs understood it, but uh, there was a lot of people that didn't understand it. Uh, it had lots of bells and whistles, it was really powerful, but another, another thing, that consultant, he wasn't around for very long. And there was no clear documentation on how to write more tests other than digging into the code and trying to figure out what it's doing. So um, the good th the pros on this are the devs were provided training. There was a big push for devs to have automation on every um, piece of new, co new code that was written. So all of our stories, we had tasks for automation uh, doing Scrum and we would complete the tasks for our development. When it came to automation, we had time constraints, and what's the first thing that goes in the trash? It's that automation sticky. Just, all right, next sprint, we gotta keep going. Um, so we had time constraints, we had a big push. Uh, automation didn't really happen. There was also no standardization on what data or environment or setup um, that we had automation set up on, which caused only certain tests to pass in all the environments. Um, so we also didn't have any nightly automation scripts running. It was just basically a, some files in the repo that you could just go in, if you know how, to start it, because there's no documentation on how to run it, but go in and try to run it and try to get results. Um, so <laughs> we then shifted with inside the same framework. So we realized, hey, tests aren't getting written, like the devs aren't doing it, um, so we decided to pass these tasks off to contractors. And they're contracts we trust, so we still trust them. Um, but we as quality assurance engineers, we wrote pages and pages of documentation of what exactly should be clicked and what to expect on the screen, what to verify against. And the way in which we wrote these tests, um, a little ashamed, we basically had the first test of each suite um, created data, which was then used for the entirety of the 72 other tests that were written. Um, so we had a 25 minute long UI test that required on that first test passing and the second test passing and so forth. So these tests 
one, we're flaky because we didn't really know what we were doing very well. Uh, we had one spec file, so it was like, you just had to start it at the beginning and hope it finished. And if it didn't, like wait 10 minutes to get to the part where you need to debug. Um, so it was, it was pretty rough. Um, the good thing though, is it was able to provide some sort of feedback. Like we knew that those tests that did pass, like they passed. The bad was it was very difficult to debug. It was hard to maintain. And if one test failed, they all failed. Uh, we were also still not running these tests at night. Okay, so that happened. That was our past and a lot of the failures and some of the stuff that we've learned. And so now I'm gonna take you into the present. And this is actually like the good stuff of the talk. I know we just had lunch, and so for all the humans in the room dozing off and who have an average attention span of five minutes, I'd like to invite you back into the talk now <laughs> uh, with the promise that it's about to be really helpful. Um, and I'm going to start with a tool that we built to solve our problem around test data, which we call the data factory. Um, this is absolutely essential for where we are today as a company and in the life cycle of our product. This is not an original thought of ours, disclaimer. We first learned about this concept at CAST 2014 in a talk by Richard Bradshaw. He has a blog called The Friendly Tester. The data factory is a Ruby gem that we built to set up and delete whatever test data we want. And we started implementing this almost a year ago, which is about when I started growing this beard, so one beard ago. <laughs> and it's been really valuable. Uh, previously, like what said, we would build up test data the only way we knew how, by like clicking through the application. Um, it took forever to get through our tests, and it took forever to build up test data. Ain't nobody got time for that, right? <laughs> right? This tool gives you the ability to start your test really close to the finish line with everything already set up. And it gives you the luxury of only testing the feature that you care about. Um, to kind of break this out of the automated testing, I'm trying to give like a real life example. Just imagine that you need to make dinner for some people. Um, if you're making it from scratch, you actually, first step is just to go out to the store, right? Get to go to the grocery store, buy ingredients, come home, prepare the food to be cooked, put it in the oven, enjoy the meal. Well, the data factory is almost like providing you instant, pretty like chopped up every, all your ingredients prepared instantly so that all you have to do is just toss them together and measure your expected outcome. Um, it's been super cool. Another tool that I want to mention has been really cool for us. First of all, Talk Boy, you guys remember that? <laughs> Solid, right? All right. Um, this is something we called the Data Watcher. One of our awesome developers had like a really bright idea to build this tool. He built a utility that allows us to specify a database, and then it watches the database and records any insert or update that occurs, and then it outputs what happened in beautifully formatted SQL or Ruby syntax. This is super cool. You can tell it to like, watch this database, go around, click around, whatever action you want, and then just press a button, and it'll give you the output of what you need. It's facilitated building up our data factory really quickly, and we found it valuable in testing other stuff, too. Um, one other thing that I do want to mention around test data is, like, the SQL data setup. So um, we have this 1,400-line SQL script that we use to set up our vital test data. Um, if you think back to that amazing cooking analogy that we used, uh, to say the data factory gets you all of the ingredients that you need to prepare a meal, well, we don't actually rely on the data factory to build up the entire kitchen infrastructure of an oven, refrigerator, pots, pans, everything. Uh, we're relying on it for every, to do the data factory to do that, every single test uh, would be way too much overhead. It would take too much time. So having like static data in place made it really easy for us to write tests when we can trust that the indispensable stuff was already there, didn't need to build it up. And it's also made it easier to set up automation in our other QA environments because we've got our essential infrastructure all in that one script and we can point it to a new database, run it, and know that we've got the essential stuff already in place. So you just learned how we created and managed our test data. Uh, now onto how we use the browser to navigate the tests. Uh, so we are still using water. Uh, we didn't find that helpful. Um, we added another gem to it called page object. And uh, that's a uh, driver, a gem out there. I think Jeff Cheesy Morgan, if you've got heard of him, that's kind of his, it's on his repo and we use it and we love it. It is very well documented. Go check it out. It makes it really easy to use. And a guy named Justin Coe, he answers a lot of Stack Overflow questions before I can even try to respond. 
um, which makes me sad, but I really like him because he's, he's my stack overflow hero. Um, but we also use RSpec in conjunction with these tests. Um, and then the, the biggest difference between page objects and the, the water mate is the documentation. I mean, that was really key for us and key for adoption where we could just, instead of train someone every time a new developer came in and wanted to write a test, we could say, hey, look at the documentation. That's how you do it. Uh, and then from that, we were able to build up examples and we could say, hey, here's a good example to look at. So um, it basically allowed both testers and developers to start writing tests uh, easily. Um, we also built the framework to use Configatron in order to easily specify an environment you want to test again. So when we're running our test, we just pass in an environmental variable, and that's what uh, environment is going to run against. Um, and we also put standards in place. Like standards can be really helpful in situations like this. Uh, here's a few of them. One a big one we put in is every test should be self-reliant and able to run independently. So if you think back about our like horror water mate story, like where we had one test that, yeah, it was bad. Um, basically now we've got hundreds of tests and every test is going to set up its own data using the data factory, which Jeremy talked about. Um, also, we're gonna use the data factory to create delete test data. So we start a test, we're gonna create some data that we're gonna test against, when we're done, we're gonna delete that data so it's not just junking up our database. Um, we're also, because we have this awesome data factory, for our assertions and expectations, we want to use our data factory over the UI for those assertions. So over like screen scraping a web page to try to find a certain value in like a multi-row table, which can be hard, it can be done, but it can be hard. Um, we, we're just going to go check the database. Hey, what should that value be in the database? Okay, if it's there in the database, we trust the UI is going to display it properly. So a couple more. For page objects, um, don't use XPath. So disclaimer, like all XPath is not bad, but when your XPath looks like this, um, you can figure that out, but do you really wanna take the time to? <laughs> no, you don't. Um, this is actual like an XPath from our WaterMate framework. And we decided that Hey, like if we can't use XPath, like we need a dev to do some work. And we all agreed on that as a team, on a, as a dev team and a QA team. And um, we agreed to it. So we put that standard in place. If we can't locate it with a class or an ID um, or like a child or parent element easily, like we need to do some dev work. So, all right, here we go. All tests should leave the session in the same state it found it or better. So we're using a web application, so you have a login to test one thing, one part of the system with certain permissions. You may have to log out and log back in as a different user with different permissions, different things they should see. So in those tests, kind of our rule was, we've got this default login, you're always gonna leave, it's kind of like the Boy Scout rule, right? You're always gonna leave it better than the way you found it, or at least the same. So that's kind of the, the rule, the standard there. And also, um, be dry, so don't repeat yourself. Um, when it comes to the page object framework, that basically allows us to have just a page file where we can input all these elements that go on all the pages, so like the links, the buttons, the text fields, um, and it allows our tests to basically call those fields. Um, another example of this, um, we actually input like EFT numbers in our system all over the place. So instead of just doing that all over the place in our test, we created a method input valid EFT. And we went through, added the steps to do that. So if you want to input a valid EFT, you just call that method and it goes and does it for you. So normal programming stuff. <laughs> um, flaky crust, yummy. Flaky UI test, bad. Um, we run into the problem of flaky tests. Uh, test that fails, run again, it passes, and fails, it passes. It's very frustrating. Um, when dealing with the flaky test, our team was really not able to trust the results of our automated tests. So our solution uh, has been to just rerun the failures before marking the test run as failed. Our, our web app, like after a deployment, it takes a long time at just in time compiling. So certain areas of the system just take forever for the page to load. And so if we would just rerun tests, then we would actually get success, like if you did it a few times. 
So that's, that's actually worked really well for us once we got that in place. Um, if there was a test that's failing at that point, then it demands attention. It either needs to be like given some love or it needs to be taken out. Um, also, as we made progress writing more tests, our test run became more than two hours. And that was way too long to have to wait for feedback. So we started running tests in parallel using this Ruby Gem uh, parallel test. Uh, we were running the box on, with one core, so we added four cores and split the test into four threads. So our test run is down uh, from two hours to like 30 minutes, which is better. We know that's not ideal, but that's where we are right now. And that's like 500 checks we're doing in 30 minutes. Um, so it's better. So for our uh, CI tool, we're actually using Jenkins. Um, we use it for both builds and deploys along with running our unit integration and functional UI tests. Um, who in here uses Jenkins? Yes, good job guys. It's free too, what? That's crazy. So you can't pay like the guys to like help you with it, but you don't have to, there's Google. Um, but you can if you like them, they're really nice guys. All right, so Jenkins, it is awesome. Uh, you can configure to do whatever, um, and we basically have those running nightly um, against our QA servers. Um, yep, so this is kind of what our dashboard looks like. Um, we actually have this um, in front of the teams that are developing in these environments. Um, this is actually, I think, maybe it's like a plugin or something, but it's, it's pretty easy to find. Um, but this is gonna display the results to the entire team via dashboard. So. We're not doing emails just because people don't open their emails, a lot of our devs. Um, but if there's a monitor sitting in their pod where they can see it and it's big, fat, and red, uh, they're gonna see that. So we kind of have this displayed all over the place. Um, so if it's red, the team knows there's an issue. Pretty obvious, right? Also, Jenkins has an option to track who checked in the last and display them as a possible culprit. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so. We are running these tests nightly and throughout the day as new code is checked in and deployed. So new code gets checked in, we wanna do a build, deploy. Um, we're also gonna go ahead and kick off an automation test after that. Um, it's kind of, it's a manual process, but it's super easy, it's a button click. So um, it's gonna give us immediate feedback, tell us the health of the code base, and it's, it's that continuous feedback. You mentioned that you were running uh, multiple uh, automation tests um, we're doing like unit integration and functional UI, but like this talk is kind of focused and where we've put our efforts is on that functional UI side. So like clicking through the GUI and yeah. Okay. So as it stands today, we found a lot of value out of what we put into this. Um, we found like more than 15 issues that were worth reporting in JIRA. Uh, there, there's there have been several that we just haven't even put in there because there was a quick fix of uh, somebody blowing something up. But even more than that, um, we've caught like merge issues where we would have uh, you know, a feature that the whole testing cycle has been completed and run through and everybody's put their blood and sweat into it and it looks awesome. And it's been merged to another branch for release. And at that point, somebody else merged something else and code was overwritten. And so we're kind of at the state where it has already been put in and checked in that new branch but then some other action occurred and that code went away. And we weren't having any other plans to check that before deployment. We've, that's happened twice now that we've been able to catch those prior to going to production. That's good. That's, yeah. <laughs> All right, so while everything that we have in place right now is awesome, we do believe it's gonna fail, just like the previous attempts have failed, if it's not adopted by our team. Uh, we need automation to be a routine part of the entire development team's conversation. It has to be part of our culture. So um, we've come to accept that investing in automation will take longer to get stories done. And we're okay with that because we know that not having it will put us back in the routine of doing manual regression every two weeks. So when we break down a user story, we're gonna ask the question, do we need automation around this? And if the answer is no, that's okay. Not everything does. But if the answer is yes, we're gonna aim for the ideal, our testing pyramid, right? We're gonna ask the question, should it be a unit test? Should it be an integration test for this? What UI test, if any, are, are required? So we're gonna shoot for the ideal. We're not gonna just stay where we are with UI tests forever. <laughs> All right, so just some metrics on kind of where we are. Um, today we use Incrunch as a utility that runs against our code base and reports back test coverage and percentage. So 
that's kind of like the unit test code coverage you've kind of heard it talk about. So right now we're at like 7%. Um, that was actually at 3% like six months ago. So we actually need some work, um, but getting that up to 7%, we had to do a whole lot of refactoring to add that stuff and a lot of testing um, on top of that. So, um, and then one of our main components, which is like a financial component, uh, we do have integration tests. It's, it's a form of an API to use an in-service bus. So we're able to uh, write some integration tests to do some checks and then some verifications in like a database we would stand up with that integration test. And um, we also have the UI test coverage. So right now, we basically like have this really long manual regression list, and we basically put all those on a spreadsheet and started like working through them. And as we work through them, um, the amount of test cases that are covered is at 77%. So that's kind of where we are during like a full regression cycle. So, um, in, so I'm going to swap it up a little bit. So this is kind of like our test coverage, our regression list that's covered. Um, we also have kind of like another metric we measure. It's just how much time does this stuff take? And um, so this, like a regression cycle, is what we would normally test to ensure basic functionality throughout the system. So this is not every single check, every like crazy test scenario um, possible, but it's just kind of like, what would we normally do before we kind of ship it to give it kind of the, the, the green light? Um, so a full regression cycle would take um, basically uh, 70 hours, a little over one test or an entire sprint. That was with no automation. Um, with their standard, our standard manual regression efforts now are at about 12 hours. So about one test or two days. That's with the automation in place running through those um, specs we've written. So in estimates of time, this is kind of the percentage breakdown. So our time covered, or time, percentage of time spent, like 15% of it's manual, like 85% of it is automation, which is pretty awesome. So, yeah. All right, we're gonna finish up talking about the future. We did it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not the case. All bad things must come to an end. And so the data factory, which we know and love, is actually an awful solution long term. Uh, we're adding our business logic in two places, the application and the data factory. So if a change is required, it now needs to be made in two places. And if someone comes along and changes our app, but doesn't go back and change our data factory, our test data could be in, like out of sync with what's really happening and we could have a test that potentially passes when it should fail. So our solution long term is to start building things API first. This will allow us to set up test data using the application API instead of the data factory. And we actually have like a newer product where we work that is doing it this way. They have avail APIs available through the application, so the automated UI tests build their test data using the application API. Um, it's really cool because the interface, if you're a tester and you're writing a, a test for this product or for this product, it looks almost identical. So as you like queuing up the data that you want for your test, you interact with it the same way, but behind the scenes, this one's just calling the application API, um, which is the way to go long term. So, that's our talk. What, we want to hear questions from you guys and talks and stuff. It was so much of this was, I won't call it experimentation, but what was the pain point in the trial and error of this doesn't work, you have to refactor that effort to get it to the point where you have the stability and reusability that you just had? What were some of the pain points along the way? Are you talking about in our automation framework or in our application itself? Automation. Okay, yeah, automation. to that point. Gotcha. I think the biggest thing was getting, like using the page object framework and using, uh, I, I guess the biggest thing would just be that data setup, using the data factory to create our static data. So one of our standards is um, we don't want to, we want every test to be able to run by itself. Mm -hmm. So instead of going to like add a member, like go through like these 20 fields and there's like a two minute test and then doing something with that unit, we're able to basically just talk to the database and say, hey, go generate that unit just like you would from the front end, and then land on, start on this page, and we're gonna test one thing on this page, and then we're gonna delete that unit, pass or fail, and then go away. So I think the bigger thing was just migrating to that, 
that thought process of like one test per thing, um, and then having that data generated on the fly for each test and not relying on other tests to set up that data. So that was kind of like the biggest challenge I think we overcame. Whoa, awesome. <laughs> All right, you first, what's your name? Tina. What's up, Tina? Hey, you guys are awesome. Um, I just wanna ask, so for your turning point, was it more of a turning Tool and they're excited for it, then you're going to have more success. So I was wondering if that's what you experienced. Yes. Um, yeah, like our, our team has been on board before. And I mean, this is kind of one of those things that even behind the scenes, even if you've got a development team on board, I'd say like if you don't have like other people on board, like arguing that, hey, they should be spending their time, it's worth paying them to do this, um, it's, it's hard to get buy in to do it. But yeah. I, we're we're fortunate, I guess. Like I don't know if we're qualified to give this talk for every other workplace because we work with like really friendly, smart, <laughs> funny like, people. You know, they're just cool people. There's no divide between development and QA. Like we really feel like we're team members, and so they felt the pain a bit too, right? Like if we're doing manual regression for two weeks, they're like, hey, stop building stuff. We need to like test it. So. It was their pain point too, and that really helps. Like, if it's a rock in their shoe, then they want to slow down and get it out, right? And to add on to that, we did have like a director role change, which they asked more questions. We were able to give feedback and put together a task force of what should we do, and um, other certain scenarios like our system not doing very well for a while. Like, basically allowed us to say, hey, for the next three months, we're going to defend our hill. We're going to stop doing new features and we're going to focus on maintenance and automation and that was really a big turning point into that but so just make make things catch on fire and then <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go we're going to go this way if that's okay so we'll go back to the back what's your name you, you have a flat shirt on uh, mark. hey mark uh, so the question that i have was uh, related to the, when you went to parallel testing um, did you, were you doing that in a shared data environment or did you have a way of isolating uh, data so that you had independent tests with, without the side effects? Yeah, so, yeah, so most of our, that's a good question because you're thinking of like, hey, we're going to delete stuff and add stuff. So each test, since we are calling like the data factory gem, it's going to create a unit and keep that ID and then do all the tests with that ID before it deletes it. So we're not like, we, we didn't write tests that said, hey, select stop top star one this for this to do the verification. We're actually gonna look it up by this unit that you just created this fee for, go make sure it's this amount. So we kind of, we thought through that, like at the beginning, hey, we are probably gonna run this in parallel. Let's make it like, so it can grow. Did I answer your question? <coughs> awesome, so back here in the black. Yes. You say that you generate your scripts by clicking around on the UI. Yes. So, um, how do you generate your native scenarios? How do you do your validations against those objects since you want to generate your scripts by clicking? And so, how do you go about the native testing? Okay, so I think, I think I'm going to answer your question. I don't know if I'll answer the negative question side, but it sounds like, hey, if you're just clicking around the system to generate data through the, uh, or we're going to call the data watcher, that's going to be what saves kind of the SQL script. Um, we use that to basically create the data factory um, information. So a lot of our logic is in stored procedures. So it's not like we could just dig into the code and figure out what's going on. Like a lot of it's there. So doing this data factory or using the data watcher, so watching a specific database and then like adding a fee, we can actually go see every single column that is added or updated when adding a fee or making a payment. And we're basically taking that and putting it in the data factory is something we would call like if we need a unit with a fee that we need to like cancel like we would take the add fee part put it in our test put it in the data factory so we could add a fee on the fly and then our test would just be click cancel on the ui so does that answer your question Um, so the data factory, yes. So it's not just a click and paste. It's basically like it puts it out to a text file and we are smart about 
what we move over to the data factory. So it's more like a tool that gives us like stuff prettily syntaxed that we don't just blindly copy and paste it. We copy and paste it and put in there what's right, what we think's right and parameterize it. That makes sense. We can talk more, all right, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was wondering, maybe a couple questions. Um, um, I noticed you know, that you guys are doing about the wide R, the Ruby, and, and I guess the advantage of that is having all of the other Ruby gems that are out there. But I was curious as if you guys had looked at and or used any other open source stacks, maybe just like um, set up a Java and Selenium, and if so, you know, what were the advantages or disadvantages of, and why you chose to go with the YR as opposed to those tools? Yeah. I'm not sure I remember, I know that there was like a level of uh, checking, this is kind of like before we were even involved in the QA team at that point, so like I wasn't personally involved in like level of investigation. I know that they did some, they chose to go that route initially and we found value there. Um, at some point, that was the framework we were using, and so it was to our benefit to kind of like start learning Ruby. Like me, I, I didn't know how to code. Um, did I, you know, I'm a liberal arts kid, honestly, like communication major. Like, more qualified to do this than my actual job, right? So, um, <laughs> with that, I, mean, I kind of lost my point. I tried to make a joke. <laughs> yeah. Basically, if we haven't explored it. Like these were kind of the tools that were there. We kind of grew into them. We said, hey, there's a need to learn Ruby. So we learned Ruby. And I would say looking back, because um, I've used kind of like Selenium using Ruby and Water using Ruby. And just that Water syntax is a little easier for me. It's a little more readable. But I, we know people who use Selenium. And like it's Water is just a wrapper on top of Selenium. So it's, it's kind of the same. It's just. Because there's something that was there that was available to you guys. Yeah. And it was, it was like possible for us to learn it too. Like, I, I think when I looked at something, there seemed like there was a lower barrier to like entry for somebody like me. It's like wants to contribute and help the team. Like, you know, all right, maybe I'll just learn what a string is today. And maybe next week I'll learn that there's an integer data type. And there was just like small like steps that it just seemed achievable. Um, so it was, it was cool. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah, dude. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to say for him, uh, so I've had a lot of experience with both the Java Selenium stack and the Water Ruby stack. There's a lot more boilerplate code in the Java, so you're gonna be like repeating yourself a lot in terms of definitions, and Ruby's really awesome with some of its uh, more dynamic tools like the page object stuff, makes it so that they're not doing like define click button, and then they end up by click button, they have a different method that they have to call for define what the button is and like all that. Uh, Ruby's really good at letting you kind of just like wipe it all out and be like, define a button, and then it will go through and make like, yes, you can click the button, and you can read the button, and you can like do whatever you want with the button. Ruby's a really uh, quick dynamic language and has a lot less. And what's your name? Spencer. That's Spencer. Hopefully we can get him to do a talk next year because <laughs> <laughs> sounds awesome, right? So give him, prod him on. Over here. Yeah. Um, well, one back here first. Um, so you were describing your journey and how you came to settle on focusing on UI tests. You said you have a lot of uh, business logic embedded in the database. Did you ever investigate a tool to unit test sort of procedures like PCP or writing a SQL test? Because where possible, you want to find an issue with the, with the sort of procedure in a unit test for that sort of procedure, not wait until it hits the client. I'm just curious if you ever investigated. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've thought about it because somebody said, hey, why don't we try to do this? But that's not something that I have kind of jumped into. I know our like director of development, we've kind of talked through that, but that's not something that we've like heavily explored. I feel like we've kind of pushed this, kind of helped the, put the wind in the sail for the ship to kind of keep going as far as like the UI automation. So I feel like if I knew more about that, I would definitely probably try to push that. Yeah, we're not anti that. That sounds pretty cool. I'd love to learn about it. Google. Yeah. <laughs> Free. Yeah, awesome. Yes. Did you? Yeah, I just want to know what's the name of the, um, the plugin that you use for JQuery or the plugin that you use. I think that actually comes standard. I think it's just a view. Yeah, it's within Jenkins. Yeah, it's a Jenkins view. Oh, I 
Boom. Jenkins is awesome. <laughs> Anybody else? We have six minutes. Oh. So he was a liberal arts major. Were you a computer science major? I was a social work major. Okay, okay. <laughs> close enough, pretty close. <laughs> so were you, were, did, did somebody, was there a, some kind of leader at, uh, at your company that like went to you guys and said, hey, you gotta solve this problem. Regression testing's taking too long. Or were you guys there doing the regression testing and you said, we gotta solve this problem, this is awful. How did that, how did that come about? And then if I could ask a second part. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if there was, how you got, you mentioned you had a couple of months or something to work on yeah. this tech debt. How did you pull that off? Did you have to, <laughs> I mean, how did you stop the product team from telling you to develop new features? So Yeah, so okay. I'll answer number two first, because okay. that's easy. Um, so number two was we had imagine a building on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a lot of customers calling in, complaining about certain things. We had certain jobs that were running twice and putting bad financial data in our system, and so yeah, it kind of, we kind of got like it was kind of like all right, one we're not doing any more releases because we had one or two things that helped cause that, but two just our infrastructure was flaky. We had like web servers going in and out of load balancers and stuff, and we had to figure a lot of that stuff out. So with that, and with customers complaining, we kind of decided like, hey, how can we stop not, how can we retain our customers? We need a time, a period to focus on that. So our VP uh, of like software services or software development, he basically said, hey, we're gonna take three months here and we're gonna get the teams and we're gonna work on maintenance because we had one person working on maintenance, and we had a, like the backlog was humongous. So we're gonna focus on maintenance, and we're gonna send out another team on automation. And during that time, we basically had this framework, I would say December of last year is kind of where we started adding tests to it. And that was from another talk on, hey, we need to get some automation in place. So we had a framework, so when that three month span time came, we had a good base of tests, examples, and we were just able to like take it from 20% to like 77%. So, and we're still adding to it. What was your first question? I already forgot. <laughs> he, he, he answered it. Okay. It wasn't, yeah, he got it. Awesome. Thanks, so. though. Cool. <laughs> so, for the three months that you had, was it um, we're going to get up to X percent and then we're going to dedicate more time during each sprint to adding to that? Or was it we're going to get to here and then we're just going to see what we can do? Yeah, our goal was to get as much done as we could. You know, so we're just gonna do as much as we could, but do it the right way, right? So they actually, uh, management and goals and all that mess, like they wanted us to like pick a number, right? And say, this percentage will be done. And I was like, I don't know, four, a thousand? Like we just wanted to like get it done. <laughs> and like build the right test, right? So that at the end of the three months, we had stuff that was valuable, not necessarily like 100% of it that doesn't work, right? So, um, so yeah, so we started we started with taking that list and saying, what's the most important? So we knew we did have a number, I think it was like fifty or seventy-five. Yeah. We we gave them a number and they're like, no, that's not good enough, and we have to, but you know. Um, that worked. But so we kind of hit our number, but like we still want to keep adding that. But we the re, the way we decided which tests to start with was what's the most valuable? What's the thing I don't want to go test yeah. manually? Um, which is the most valuable to me? Okay. Um, so, anybody Any else? Questions? Two minutes. We've never done conference speaking before, but I guess you're supposed to hang around afterwards. So if you do want to talk to us, <laughs> yeah. that's what we do. We wanted to say thanks <laughs> to Daxco. <laughs> Jason Benton, our team lead for hiring two guys without like MIS degrees or years of experience with teaching us to be testers and giving us the opportunity to learn. Um, and internet people, the folks who made this possible but we haven't met yet, we love those guys. Cheesy, Justin Coe, Stack Overflow, Richard Bradshaw. Uh, and the developers that we run to when Stack Overflow doesn't answer our questions. Uh, Caleb Tucker, Matthew Anderegg, and Stephen Williams, we love those guys. Um, so, also, one more developer. Uh, we want to thank Adam Lofton for taking this epic photo to promote our little talk today. Um, we love you guys. Thanks for showing up. Yeah.